Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our webinar um, uh, brought to you today from the Irish and UK government officials. We're going to focus on exporting agri-food from Ireland to GB and the requirements that will come into place from the 1st of October 2021. Um, so we'll be focusing on that today. If we could have the next slide, please, Kathleen. We're um, also running some readiness polls for you. Um, so if you could take a moment, please, to uh, log into Slido. The details are there on the screen. Slido and using the hashtag BPDG. We're just going to ask you a uh, question about how ready you are for import controls in GB. Thank you. And next slide. Um, throughout the webinar, we've got a Q&A function, um, so please ask your questions there. Um, by all means, just keep them coming as the webinars goes through. Um, and following this presentation, we will share a recording of the event, the slides used, and um, we will be capturing questions and producing a document that sets out the questions and answers that we've covered today. And that will all be available on gov.uk and the uh, Irish colleagues will be publishing that detail as well. Thank you. Next slide, please. So we've got a, a busy agenda for the next couple of hours. Um, we're going to have a, a brief overview of customs procedures, just to remind everybody that although we're talking about uh, procedures for moving agri-food, there are customs procedures required there as well. Um, and then we're going to have a presentation from colleagues in the Department of the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, um, followed by a presentation by the Department of Agriculture and the Marine. Then there's going to be a panel discussion um, with uh, representatives from the Food and Drink Federations in the UK and Ireland and the Logistics Associations in the UK and Ireland. And we'll wrap up with a question and answer session um, to cover off any of the questions that would remain outstanding. So a pretty packed agenda um, and I will uh, move on to the next slide, please. This is our question that I asked you, uh, mentioned earlier. So for those of you logged into Slido, um, for the rest of you could please do so. Have a think about which of these statements best applies to you. And that question will be up and available throughout the webinar. So thank you. We have a further question for you at the end. Next slide, please. This slide is just a handy um, tool to help you to understand when and uh, the requirements are changing in GB. So something for you to keep um, uh, just as a, a quick checklist. But uh, my colleagues from the Irish and UK governments will cover the detail for you now. Um, and that's probably enough for me. So I am delighted, I think, to hand over to uh, Lindsay from HMRC. If we could have the next slide, please, Kathleen. Sorry, oh, <laughs> uh, and moving on to Lindsay, thank you. Good um, morning, Margaret. Uh, thanks, Lindsay. And a very good morning to you all. Um, as Margaret mentioned, my name is Lindsay Neal and I work in stakeholder engagement as part of Customs and Border Design in HMRC. And as Margaret mentioned, this morning I'm going to walk you through a quick update on customs procedures. So just to recap, border controls are now in place with the Free Trade Agreement and the UK is now a separate customs territory. This means that the Common Transit Convention or CTC requirements apply. And new border controls for imports coming from the EU are being introduced in stages. This started on the 1st of January 2021. Now, this means that you must make customs import declarations for any goods that you've brought into the GB from the EU since the 1st of January. And if your goods are non-controlled, there are two ways that you can do this. You can either make a full declaration at the time that the goods arrive into Great Britain, or you can delay your declarations for up to 175 days by making a declaration in your records and submitting information to HMRC using a supplementary declaration. So if you're bringing non-controlled goods into Great Britain from the EU, you can make a declaration into your commercial records, um, which is known as Entry into Declarations Records or EIDR, and delay sending HMRC the full information about your goods by up to 175 days from the date of import. This information is then used to make your supplementary declaration. The supplementary declaration provides customs with more information about your imported goods. They can then work out the VAT and customs duty that you'll need to pay. 
you or someone dealing with customs for you must be authorised by HMRC to use the simplified customs import declaration processes before you can submit your supplementary declaration. And looking ahead to the 1st of January 2022, we'll arrive at the end of staged controls process for customs and HMRC will ask importers or their agent to be approved to use simplified procedures such as EIDR. And from the 1st of January 2022, entry summary declarations will be required on all imports. And HMRC will be working with stakeholders over the coming months to support them with further details on what they need to do to prepare for the introduction of full customs declarations from the 1st of January 2022. So that's just a, a, a quick walkthrough um, of the, the customs procedures and I'll hand back to Margaret now. Thanks, Margaret. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, and uh, really, I'm just going to hand over to Helena Busby from DEFRA. Thank you, Helena. Next slide, please, Kathleen. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Helena Busby, and I am the Deputy Director for EU Strategy and Negotiations at the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs in the UK. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Today, I will be focusing on import controls being introduced on the 1st of October, with a very brief reminder of the 1st of January and 1st of March requirements. This session will build on the event we ran with Irish colleagues back in July this year. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, here is a quick overview of the timeline for all of the import controls coming in for SPS require products from October until March 2022, which I am very sure you are all familiar with by now. If we can move on to the next slide, please, I will talk to you in more detail about the controls for products of animal origin. Export health certificates will be issued to you by the competent authority in Ireland. A certifying officer authorised by the competent authority must complete the official document certificate. They could be an official veterinarian or official inspector as defined by the relevant EU retained legislation. They must have clearly completed all designated fields on the certificate. You must send an electronic copy of the export health certificate to your importer in Great Britain and ensure that a physical copy of the original certified health certificate travels with the consignment. Your importer in Great Britain must upload the electronic copy of the certificate to IPAFS, that stands for the Import of Products, Animals, Food and Feed System, um, as part of the pre-notification process. Any official sanitary or phytosanitary documents that are required to accompany the health certificate such as additional attestations or lab results will be specified on the relevant health certificate. Other documentation, documentation may be required depending on the commodity, such as a catch certificate for marine caught fish. Model health certificates are available on gov.uk and you're able to use these to check the specific requirements for your commodity. And I must stress that these are examples of the certificates the real certificate will be issued by the relevant competent authority in your country. There are more details about how these certificates are filled in on the link at the bottom of this slide. And I can say that these slides will be available after this um, presentation today. If you cannot identify an appropriate health certificate, you should speak with your importer in Great Britain and check gov.uk for an import license. If there is no import license available, you will need to complete an IB58 form and send it to the Animal and Plant Health Agency. This slide contains both a link to that form and the email address to send that form to. Next slide, please, Kathleen. Phytosanitary certificates. So from 1st of January in 2022, all regulated plants and plant products will need to follow the requirements for pre-notification and be accompanied by a phytosanitary health certificate. These will need to be obtained from the plant health authority in the country where the supplier is based. An inspection for the certificate is to play, take place no more than 14 days before the consignment is dispatched from the country where your supplier is based. 
a copy of the phytosanitary certificate will need to be imported onto the import IT system PEACH if you need to pre-notify your consignment until the notification process moves over to the IPATH system later this year. Your importer will be notified when that happens. By March 2022, physical and identity checks on all regulated plants and plant products will be carried out at border control posts. Next slide, please, Kathleen. So IPAFs, which as I said, stands for the Import of Products, Animals, Food and Feed System, is the IT system that enables your importer in Great Britain to notify the relevant authorities of the arrival of animals and animal products subject to sanitary and phytosanitary controls. From the 1st of October 2021, products of animal origin for human consumption, certain animal byproducts, and high risk food and feed not of animal origin arriving from the EU will need to be pre notified via IPAPS. The key thing for EU exporters to remember here is that your importer will need to upload the electronic copy of the health certificate that you obtain from the competent authority in Ireland. Laid out in this slide is the information that must be submitted as part of an IPAPS pre notification which includes what product is being imported, the date it is being imported, which country the imported product is arriving from and the place of destination of the consignment. Between October and December 2021, importers will be required to submit a simplified notification in IPAS. From January 2022, additional details will be required. At the end of the presentation, I have included links to webinar demonstrations with more details. Next slide, please, Kathleen. A quick word on pre notification times. For products of animal origin, certain animal byproducts, and high risk food and feed not of animal origin, importers can notify no less than four hours in advance of arrival at the point of entry. Please be aware that this is a temporary arrangement and that from 1st of January, you will need to contact the competent authority at the point of entry to determine if a derogation from 24 hours can be applied. For live animals, IPAF's pre-notification must be made at least one working day in advance of the goods arrival at the point of entry. For plants and plant products, importers need to, need to, oh, sorry, need to submit import notifications at least four working hours prior to arrival for roll on, roll off and air movements are at least one working day prior to arrival by all other modes of transport, along with the phytosanitary certificate. Pre-authorisation by DEFRA or the Animal and Plant Health Agency of animal byproducts prior to any imports taking place may also be required. Next slide, please, Kathleen. Now look at composite products in a bit more detail as we receive a lot of questions on this subject. Composite products are foods that contain both processed and pro processed products of animal origin and products of animal or plant origin and where the processing of the primary product is an integral part of the production of the final product. Uh, so this could include lasagna, pork pies, mayonnaise if it contains more than 50% egg. Composite products must follow the stage requirements for products of animal origin I have just laid out. However, there are a few exceptions. Some goods are exempt if they contain less than 50% processed animal product or no meat product, and they meet the requirements set out in legislation. If your goods contain any meat product or more than 50% animal product, they must be pre-notified using IPAFs. They must be accompanied by an export health certificate and followed the phase approach set out for products of animal origin. If you're not sure this applies to you, there is more detailed guidance, including a composite product decision tree available on the animal imports file sharing link, which you will find at the end of the presentation. The next slide, please, Kathleen. Groupage. So um, this is the term used by your industry to describe the commercial grouping of multiple consignments within a single sealed trailer or container. There are four models that have been developed for importing groupage loads from the EU into the Great Britain. These include consolidation hub method, whereby different consignments are brought together at a single approved premises. The certification takes place for all individual consignments by the certifying officer and the group consignments are loaded and sealed before they leave for onward destination. 
the sequential or single model, which facilitates pickups from multiple sites. Certification takes place at each site. A seal is applied to the overall load at each pickup point removed and placed, replaced at the next pickup. This method is reliant upon a certificate of non-manipulation. There is also the linear or multiple pallet model, which is designed to facilitate pickups from multiple sites with certification at each collection point in the chain. This requires pallet level sealing. Sealed pallets are added to the means of transport and the individual seal number on the pallet recorded on the export health certificate. There is no requirement for certification certificate of non-manipulation with this model, but it does require the presence of a certifying officer at each collection point. All models may be used in conjunction with each other, so as far as general principles around sealing and certification remain. For example, traders may wish to blend the linear model with the consolidation hub method. The key with the mixed hybrid approach will be ensuring full traceability of all products entering Great Britain. Please find a link to a video recording of a webinar which goes through these models in detail on this slide. Next slide, please, Kathleen. EU origin transits. So there'll be new requirements for goods transiting from EU through Great Britain through to the EU again from the 1st of October. Uh, products of animal origin, animal byproducts will require pre-notification on IPAFs and an export health certificate. High risk food and feed stock of animal origin will require pre-notification on IPAFs only. Goods can enter and exit Great Britain through any port with no physical or ID checks required on entry or exit, however. Confirmation that the consignment has left the territory of Great Britain will be required. For those same goods travelling through from EU through Great Britain to the rest of the world, they will require pre-notification on IPAFs and an export health certificate. These goods can also enter and exit Great Britain through any port with no physical or ID checks required on entry or exit. Further guidance, again, is available online. Next slide, please, Kathleen. Um, we've uh, bundled up a few FAQs, which I will talk uh, through briefly. Um, can an IPAS no notification be made on behalf of an importer by an agent? Yes, uh, that can happen. Up to what point can a trader create amends on IPAS, such as adding the export health certificate? The not notification can be amended at any time in the process. It needs to be submitted and all documentation attached before the minimum notification time. Um, if the container is opened to get the EHC at the inspection post, would the paperwork be updated when the container is resealed by customs officials? So the first part of this question, which is what should be done when the inspection is carried out, the answer is there will be no need to update the EHC as it would have completed the imports or been rejected following inspection. So the second uh, part of the question is, is, is related to what would happen with unaccompanied loads. It is a legal requirement for goods to be accompanied by the original health certificate. It is the exporter's responsibility to ensure that the original health certificate is available when requested at the point of entry. Uh, for products of animal origin for October 1st to January the 1st, the HC does not accompany the load. Can it be forwarded once issued to the place of delivery? The original EHC should be presented and given to officials at the border control post for inspection. It is for the exporter or the logistics handler on their behalf to ensure the documents are available and presented at the BCP to the officials. Uh, next slide, please, Kathleen. Uh, further guidance, there may be other changes you need to be aware of, such as marketing standards and organics. Uh, please find links to further details on this slide, as well as useful links to further information on everything I have covered today. I would in particular bring your attention to the Plant Health Portal um, and to the file sharing site for animal products. This service does require that you sign up with an email address which may take a few days to process. However, it is full of the latest technical guidance. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here are all the relevant links. I would like to say thank you very much for your attention. As I have said, this presentation will be available after the event. I will now hand you over to my colleague, Jack Stacey, who will talk you through a step-by-step -step case 
study for exporting chicken from Ireland into Great Britain. Jack, are you there? I'm there, thank you very much. Wonderful. Next slide, please. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jack Stacey and I'm from DEFRA's Biosecurity Borders and Trade Programme. Uh, as has just been said, I'll be going through a quick case study uh, following on from Helena's far more detailed presentation uh, and that will describe the process of exporting chicken from Ireland into Great Britain uh, and that will be from October until January. Uh, so uh, getting straight into it then, the previous slide, sorry. Is it just me whose slides have completely changed? Yeah, apologies. We're just getting. Yeah, okay. There we go. OK, uh, previous slide, sorry. OK, yeah, OK. Uh, so these are the imaginary protagonists of, of this process. Uh, so we have here Kieran, who is an Irish uh, chicken exporter. We've got Claire, who is a GB importer of Kieran's chicken, uh, and we've got Joe, uh, who will be transporting the goods between EU and GB. Uh, just to note, in this case, most businesses will probably use a customs agent or a freight forwarder, um, but in, for the purposes of this case study, it's just those named on screen that will be doing the paperwork. Next slide, please. OK, uh, so the first step then, uh, Kieran will need to apply for an EU EORI number. Uh, and that'll be to uh, interact with EU systems later on. Next slide, please. OK, uh, so prior to the shipping of the goods, uh, both Kieran and Claire will need to agree the INCO terms that they'll trade on, uh, which basically just set out the responsibilities of in, uh, exporting and importing. Uh, for the purposes of this case study, Kieran will be responsible for the export procedures. Claire will be, Claire will be responsible for the import procedures and Joe's haulage company will be responsible for safety and security declarations. Uh, and the goods will not be moving under transit in this case. Next slide, please. OK, uh, Claire in turn will need to apply for a GB EORI number uh, if she hasn't already got one. Uh, and that's something that Kieran should make sure that she has before the export begins. Uh, Joe's haulage company will need both as he'll ha have to interact with uh, the systems at both ends of the process uh, and that will be the case for all parties um, even if they use a customs agent because they'll need to be able to quote the these numbers next slide please okay uh, so Kieran at this point will apply for an export health certificate uh, and the Irish certifying officer will inspect the goods and certify them uh, also issuing the certificate uh, at this point, uh, Kieran should note that he'll need to do this uh, process of applying for an EHC each time he sends his chicken to Great Britain. Um, so something that Kieran will also have to bear in mind is that the EHC will also have to travel with the goods. Uh, in most cases, that'll be just simply giving it to the driver who will be transporting them. Um, in order to pre-notify the UK authorities, uh, Claire will need to set up an IPAFS uh, import notification. Um, before that, Kieran should have sent her an electronic scanned copy, uh, which can either be a photocopy or a photograph uh, of the endorsed health certificate. Uh, and it's then for Claire to uh, upload that onto IPAFS as part of the pre-notification. Next slide, please. OK, uh, so at this point then, uh, Kieran will need to submit an export declaration, uh, formerly known as an export accompanying document, uh, and that will be to the Irish Customs System, uh, which is called the Automated Entry Processing System. Uh, this uh, export accompanying document will in turn produce a movement reference number for use later. Uh, on the export declaration, uh, he will also need to list uh, the port of exit. Uh, from there, it will go to Joe's uh, Hawley firm um, and they'll need to create a pre-boarding notification in the Irish system and insert the movement reference number uh, of the export. Uh, the pre-boarding notification ID will then need to be given to the ferry operator as part of the booking details. <clears throat> 
Yeah, so one thing to note then, uh, because uh, Kieran has submitted a combined export and safety and security declaration uh, and he's got the EAD as well, uh, he'll need to, a separate ex exit summary declaration will not need to be submitted on the member state export control system. Um, but if a combined export declaration wasn't submitted, then a new uh, exit summary declaration would be required. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, so at this point, Kieran has submitted the export accompanying document. Uh, and he's prepared the export health certificate and he sent an electronic copy to Claire, uh, at which point Joe can now uh, collect the consignment from Kieran and begin taking it into Great Britain. Uh, so uh, Joe's responsibilities then, uh, and the responsibility of the haulage company uh, is to ensure that he has all the relevant documentation. So they'll need to check that he has the pre-boarding notification and movements reference number uh, for the export declaration. Uh, he'll need the physical uh, original of the export health certificate. He'll also need the movement reference number and that will be for Claire's import declaration. Uh, and if Joe uh, is not a UK or Irish national, he'll also need to make sure that he brings his passport. Next slide, please. OK, uh, so it's at this point then that the export health certificate will be subject to the remote documentary checks. Um, and if uh, if all is uh, well and doesn't require any checks, then uh, Joe will have entered Great Britain with consignment successfully. Next slide, please. OK, uh, so that was a very brief rundown of the responsibilities from the perspective of all parties involved. Uh, just as a quick reminder then of it from the Irish exporters, exporters point of view. Uh, to begin with, you'll need to apply for an EU EORI number. Uh, you'll need to agree the INCO terms with the GB importer. You'll need to apply for an export health certificate and arrange inspection. You'll need to send an electronic copy of this EHC to the importer to upload onto IPAFs. Uh, you'll need to ensure that that original document carry, uh, travels with the goods and you'll also need to submit the export declaration uh, to Irish Customs. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's the, the process uh, to completion now, in which case I'll hand back to Margaret. Thank you very much, Jack. And uh, I'm really just going to hand over to Damien now, Damien Flynn from the Irish Department of Agriculture. Thank you, Damien. We just have a little pause while we get uh, change the slide pack. <laughs> and Damien comes off mute. The mute is not unmuting. Oh, hello. Sorry. Good morning, everyone. Apologies. Uh, Damien Flynn is my name. I'm the new head of the Brexit and International Trade Division in the Department of Agriculture. Um, I am just trying to bring up my slide pack here now. It doesn't seem to be working for me. Apologies about this. I've recently taken over from Louise Bourne, so this is not a good start. <laughs> it may be that we need to take down our slides first, Damien, if okay. Catherine or Natasha could take those down and then um, we can, uh, you'll maybe have permission to do that. Thank you. While you're doing that, I can see lots of questions coming in. Thank you all very much. We're uh, keeping an eye on those and I know my colleagues across the various departments are looking at them. Um, if we don't answer them in the chat, we will be picking them up um, in the later Q&A session, which should, as we seem to be going on course, should start at about half ten. So, Thanks, Margaret. Damien. Yeah, I think I'm OK now, Margaret. I think everyone should be able to see. Yeah, yeah, I just need to Yeah, perfect. Present Great. mode. OK, so go. apologies about that, folks. So again, my name is Damien Flynn. I'm the new head of the Bre Brexit and International Trade Division in the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. And today I'm going to be concentrating on the Irish side of uh, the process in terms of uh, ensuring that we can meet UK requirements, which will be coming in from the 1st of October. So I'm briefly going to uh, review some of the, uh, give an update on some of the preparations we've been making uh, to, to, uh, to uh, meet the UK requirements. Helena and Jack have, 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 out, have outlined those UK import requirements and my presentation today is going to focus on what we've been doing to meet them. Um, uh, I'll also be preparing uh, or giving some uh, detailed steps and process to get an export health certificate for different products. 
and to identify the key actions businesses in the Irish GB food supply chain need to take to be ready for 1st of October. Over 5 billion or some 38, 37% of total Irish agri-food exports go to the UK market, so we need to be ready to meet UK requirements from the 1st of October. Industry, DAFM and other state agents have been working hard to meet these aircrow requirements, specifically the pre-notification requirements and the export health requirements, which will come in from the 1st of October. So briefly, I'm going to run through uh, some of the, the extensive pre pre preparations that have been taking place across government and across the agri-food and fishery sectors for these changes. We must continue to ensure all actors in the supply chain know the, de the detail of the requirements and how to meet them. To this end, DAFM and other relevant state agencies, in partnership with food businesses, have been engaging in a wide range of activities to get ready. These include refinement of business processes, both at FBO level and by the department to support export certifications for GB, modification and enhancement of our IT systems to support export certification, provision of appropriate IT infrastructure across the diverse locations of our FBOs across the country to support the generation of certs. To support the scale of additional certification needed, Daffin is implementing a very significant human resource plan, which includes new staff recruitment, redeployment of existing resources and the use of contracted, contracted temporary staff as required. We have had and continue to have extensive engagement with FBOs and others in the supply chain on their needs through various fora, including surveys, direct local engagement by DAFM technical and veterinary teams, extensive rounds of training on traces and the dairy certification system, DCPS, which includes training on completion of EHC requirements. On training, a comprehensive training plan has been delivered for certifying officers and food businesses to ensure they are familiar with the EU TRACES system. Twelve TRACES webinar sessions have taken place so far, including two revision set sessions which were delivered over the, the summer months. Attendees included DAFM staff, local authority veterinary inspectors and food business operators supervised by DAFM, HSC and local authorities. FSLA and industry representatives oh, representatives also attended. We have had 916 attendees over these 12 sessions. A series of revision webinars will also be delivered throughout September. Further details will, will issue shortly on these, and I would urge any businesses who have not, not engaged with these yet to do so during September. We have also had an extensive program of trials with uh, food businesses to examine how health, export health certification will be delivered within that and resource capacity and to assess food business preparedness in areas such as IT infrastructure, the systems to provide documentation to support traceability requirements, and to clarify the individual requirements which exist for different products requiring veterinary certification. We have also done some end-to-end -end testing with our UK colleagues in July, which included some testing of the pre-notification requirements on the UK IPATH system. The learnings from these trials and testing have and are informing our approach to refinement of business processes and the learnings are being shared with industry in various fora, fora including information webinars, our training programme and through the dissemination of anonymised case studies. More broadly, we, are we continue to have a wide range of ongoing engagement with stakeholders, representatives, exporters, other government departments and agencies, with the UK authorities, other EU member states and the EU Commission. But all this preparation it is clear that the key challenge for Irish exporters and the Irish competent authorities, DAFM, HSC, Sea Fisheries Protection Agency and local authorities is to provide export health certification from the 1st of October. The number of additional certs required from DAFM is estimated to be in excess of 240,000, up, up from 60, the current 60 to 70,000 provided for third countries, which is potentially a 400% increase. This is a big challenge, which is even bigger given the geographically dispersed nature of our food businesses and the just-in-time integrated nature of Irish, Irish supply chains to Great Britain. There are some key things your business can do to prepare for these challenges. Examine the model health certificates available on DEFRA's website and confirm the cert that is needed for your products. Identify the correct CN code for the product you are exporting. Identify the individual requirements for each certificate that are relevant for each of your products. 
access information from your suppliers and then develop a process for gathering it and making it disavailable in the most appropriate format to your certifying officer. Exporters should, especially those with just in, just in time supply change, should liaise with their GB customers and request advance orders where possible. Advise and also advise them of limitations with the new search with the new certification requirements placed on, on resources, both at business level and, and for certifying authorities. The IT systems to be used to apply for ex export health certificates vary across the commodity groups. For meat, meat products, meat preparations, composite products, honey and table eggs, the EU traces system will be used to apply for and generate certs. For dairy products, including dairy composites, dairy product certification system with DAFM's dairy product certification system will be used. For fish and fishery products, the, 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 we will continue to, can continue to use the existing sea fishery protection agency processes. Moving on to the detailed export process, there are essentially four main components to exporting to GB. Import number one, importer requirements, which have which my UK colleagues have co covered earlier, specifically the pre-notification on IPAS, which is new from the 1st of October, and also the existing customs requirements, which have been in place since the 1st of January. Number two, exporter customs requirements. Exporters must submit the combined export and ex EXX direct declaration through revenues automated entry processing system. Estimated time of departure must also be completed as part of this declaration. Number three is the new exporter SBS requirements. The, S the exporter must apply for an export health certificate via their competent authority. However, the, the application varies by slightly by commodity. I will cover these the, the, the processes for different products in further slides. Um, the final step before leaving uh, for the UK, before leaving for the UK, is a, is a useful checklist. Pre-notification declaration to IPAS, export declaration completed, customs documents completed, customs pre-boarding pre notification, uh, PBN secured, and the export health cert is traveling with the load. I will now run through the steps to secure an export health cert by product category, starting with meat and meat composite products. Many of the steps are common to all commodities, so in my slides covering non-meat products, I will highlight, I will just highlight the specific elements which are different for each product. The traces system will be used to apply for and generate certs for meat and meat products. All businesses exporting these products must ensure that they are registered on traces to ensure they are listed on the approved list of establishments allowed to export to UK and to be able to apply to DAFN for an export health certification. The exporter must make the application for an EHE in traces and at the same time must also alert the relevant regional veterinary office of the upcoming export via email. This should be done five days in advance of export date by completing the basic consignment email details on traces. The application on traces can be made in multiple steps with information that is available in advance being submitted earlier so that the traceability elements required for certification can be verified and the cert can be approved can then be approved quickly once the final details are known for example transport details final weight etc staff and the relevant veterinary office will review the application and issue the cert if requirements are met the EHG is generated signed and stamped by the certifying officer generally as an official veterinarian and the original EHC is made available to the exporter the Irish exporter can then email a scanned copy of the signed EHC to the GB importer. The GB importer will upload the EHC onto IPAS. This should happen before the consignment arrives in GB. If you have any, any, excuse me, if you have any questions on meat and composite product export health certification process, please contact your local veterinary uh, team and make sure that you, uh, make sure that you have a key step is to have all your traceability documents available. Um, we would put up at the end of the slides, we will put up uh, details of the contact numbers for traces, the traces help desk, and also the Brexit call health desk, which can take queries, specific queries you have. 
Moving on to dairy products. For dairy products, the system for applying for a dairy health certificate is slightly different. Exporters will need to apply for a certificate through the department's dairy product certification system, DPCS. This is the system we use for certification to ex certification of exports uh, for all dairy products to tour countries. The application should be made seven days or five working days in advance of export. The key message is, is that you make the application as early as possible. When making the application, not all the inform information needs to be made at the same time of at the time of application. Amendments can be made to the application before sign off as the as the information becomes available before the export date. However, the earlier the full information is known, the easier it would be to have the certification provided in line with planned export date and time. Once the EHC process is completed, the original EHC is made available in hard copy to the exporter via the, the DATHAM's newly created dairy hubs. As with all EHCs, the exporter should send a copy of to the GB importer for uploading to IPAS. In the event of further queries in relation to dairy exports, please contact Dairy Certs Help Desk at agriculture.gov.ie. Again, details of this these contact this contact uh, details will be provided at the end, on the slides. The key difference between meat products and dairy products is the is the IT system which is used to generate and apply for export health certificates. Moving on to animal byproducts. Applications for animal byproducts should also be made through the Traces IT system and the relevant regional veterinary office should be emailed to be notified, notified of the upcoming certificate, or upcoming export. Export, uh, the veterinary office start alert to the new EHG application will carry out preliminary checks and the application will return if edits are needed. Staff in the veterinary office perform desk based checks to review consignment details on traces, for example, product type, weight, number of units, container and seal numbers. The veterinary inspector verifies that the requirements of the EHC are met. This includes on-site risk-based inspections of consignments by the veterinary inspector. Operate, operator seals under, under DATM supervision if required. Operate, excuse me, uh, operator seals are required under DATM super, super, supervision. The DAFM prints off the copy of the EHG and provides it to the EHG is signed and stamped by the veterinary officer. For sites with a permanent presence, the hard copy EHG is available from the site. For sites with a non-permanent presence, hard copy EHG is available to the exporter by collection from the, sign, the signing veterinary office, veterinary office. Table legs. Applications for table legs should be made through the Traces IT system also, and on receipt of the local CERT reference number from Traces, the exporter will be required to submit an application form with supporting doc documents by emailing egghealthcerts at agriculture.gov.ie. This should be done five days in advance of, ex of the export date. The application and supporting documentation will be reviewed, and if an order, the EHC will be issued, and the CERT will be sent to the exporter. Finally, for honey, like meat, the meat certification pro process, applications for honey export health certs will be made through the Traces IT system. Applications for sunny, honey export health certificates must also be alerted to DAFM's honey inspectors at beekeeping at agriculture.gov.ie. They are located in the department's laboratory in Backwestern. Applications for EHG should be made three days, three working days in advance of the export date. So that's a run through the key steps and how to be, how to how to secure a, an export health set for the different commodities. I just want to now emphasize some key messages uh, to get ready for the 1st of October. Familiarize yourself with the Irish and UK customs and SBS requirements for exporting goods to Great Britain. A key element here is to identify the right certs for your products. If possible, restructure processes to apply for export health sets during normal working hours. To, to ensure that uh, the resource capacity on the, on the, for, for the, the competent authority matches the business requirement. Ensure full traceability information and supporting documentation is available. Put in place a system to organize these documents to align with your certifying officer's needs. Identify the right staff to interact with traces and the dairy certification system as appropriate. Minimize the number of consignments needing certification by just by considering distribution from within the UK, within Great Britain, excuse me, where possible. 
access the information material and guidance on the UK and Irish government websites. And the final message I would say is engage, engage, engage with your local veterinary supervisor. This is critical to ensuring that there is alignment between the competent authority who are certifying and the business needs of the, of the FBOs on the ground. Finally, I have a couple of slides at the end which show the, the, the supports that are available and the key and links to previous presentations and, up, and details about upcoming web webinars. These will be in the slide pack that cir circulated after, the, after this webinar. And finally, the final slide is all the contact details for all the relevant uh, call centres and state agencies. Uh, please do contact us if you have queries. We're more than happy to engage and make sure that we, we uh, do our best to answer all questions. So with that, I'm going to say thank you for listening and we we'll move on to the, the next session. So I'll hand you back to Margaret and then we'll have a chance for questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Damien. Um, and just while we change over slides again, bear with us, everybody. I just thought I'd um, point out we're beginning to see some themes coming up in the many questions that you're submitting. Thank you. Um, and um, just to give our officials a bit of a heads up, I suppose, really, we're seeing themes around the requirements for IPAFs. Who can register for IPAFs and how? What certificates are needed for what product and when do you need them and how do we go about getting them? Um, there's some questions about the transit regulations and um, a number of questions about very small consignments, business to customer consignments. Do they still need certificates? I'm afraid I know the answer to that, but I won't spoil uh, uh, the story and we'll come back to that in a little while. And I'm delighted now to hand over to, um, oh, I've Helena and Luke and uh, um, various uh, trade associations for the part two, where we're going to have a technical session. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Um, my name is Luke Myers. I'm here today on behalf of Heather Jones, who many of you in the audience may know. A bit of a look, a different look and feel for this section because this is going to be a bit more interactive. We're going to have trade associations speaking with us today. Um, without further ado, could I have the next slide, please? So I will be hosting today alongside Damien, who we've just heard from. Hello, Damien. Um, I'll hand over to you, Damien, just to introduce some people on your side, if that's OK. Sorry, my unmute is very slow today. Uh, yeah, thanks, Luke. Thanks very much for that. Um, so uh, from the DAFM side, we're, we have a number of colleagues on the line um, who are going to help us in answering the questions from, from the trader organisation. So we have Tony Devlin, who's the head of our uh, uh, veterinary health uh, implementation team. Uh, me, uh, Lorna Meany, who's the head of our veterinary export uh, veterinary export policy team. Uh, Michal O'Mahony from the Sea Fishery Protection Agency. Uh, Connor O'Mahony from our dairy uh, division, uh, Fiona Reardon who works with Lorna and has been heavily involved in the trials and testing we've been doing, uh, Michael Moran also works with uh, Lorna and has been heavily involved in the export certification and uh, the, 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 the trader notices and the, the veterinary uh, notices to, to uh, details uh, for providing certification. Uh, Kevin McKeever from our organics uh, uh, division and Ray Broderick from uh, from our animal byproducts uh, division. And we're also joined by Rob Doyle, who is the director, which has responsibility for all of this. So Rob is the big boss. Uh, thanks, Luke. Well, thank you. Um, and I will hand over to my colleague Helena, who is leading from DEFRA today uh, to introduce some folks from DEFRA. Good morning. Um, I'm really delighted that we have a really strong panel for you um, from, from DEFRA. Um, of course, you've got myself um, as Deputy Director for EU Strategy and Negotiations um, and, and Jack, who you just heard from, who's, a, who's one of our engagements and communications managers. But we also have um, Nigel Benwell, who is the head of our engagement, communication and business uh, team in our Borders Protocol Delivery team. Uh, we have Vicky Clark in our plant health and imports delivery uh, space, Leila Kituyi who is a EU to GB animal imports operability team lead 
Uh, Jack Tilbury, who you might have heard from before, who is our policy delivery and engagement lead on the import of animals and their products. Anthony Ridge, who's a veterinary advisor, um, particularly on veterinary trade facilitation. Scott Reaney, who's co-head of imports and EU trade, who can cover off transits. Uh, Suzanne Verhoeven, who is a products of animal origin imports policy lead. Angela Cooper, who knows all about IPAFs and is the IPAFs project manager. Uh, Lisa Ramsey, who's also a communications manager, as well as Angela Derbyshire. Um, so I hope we have uh, enough of the right sort of people to be able to answer any questions that you might want to uh, put to us. Thank you, Damien and Helena. I mean, I can see Margaret already rubbing her hands together um, for the Q&A session. We have such a good uh, and extensive panel from both sides. Um, if I could just have the next slide, please, quickly before we get into the, the hearing from the industry. So just very quickly, um, some updates from us. The Haulier Handbook has been published. I've just posted a link in the chat. Um, this, I think, is a really good demonstration of the, the links we have with industry. Um, there was a lot of collaboration from EU hauliers as well as UK hauliers. And without wishing to embarrass anybody who might be about to speak, I know Logistics UK and their representative Sarah was extremely involved in that process as well. So it shows the engagement we have with industry and, and how you help lead our communication strategy and what we put out. Um, we also have our regular meetings with industry as well, of which this forms a part. Um, and I won't bore you with any further details from that slide. You can have a look in your own time. If you could have the next one, please. Uh, just some, we had a meeting, it was all the way back in February now with some um, Irish uh, associations and UK counterparts and officials from both sides as well. Uh, Damien was on that meeting, I believe, way back when. Um, some groupage loads resolved. Uh, DEFRA spoke about that earlier and there's further information available, so thank you for that. And the IPATH system guidance, again, DEFRA addressed earlier in the presentation today. There's also materials available online and I know from the questions in the chat that many of you have been involved in IPATH trials and so on. Um, some ongoing there as well, which we may talk about today. So without further ado, could I have the next slide, please? Um, we're going to, so we've got four industry speakers today representing some of the key uh, sectors for agri-food, both the food sector themselves and the logistics sector uh, across both UK and Ireland. So I think Damien, unless you'd like to say anything, uh, the plan is to just get get straight to industry. Is that okay? Yeah. Well, thank you. Could I ask Luke Hindlaw from the Food and Drink Federation, please, to, to speak first? Yeah, thank you, Luke. So my name is Luke Heinlaw. Uh, I represent uh, the Food and Drink Federation. We represent food and drink manufacturers here in the UK. And there's probably a lot of joint members across that have a presence in Ireland. So I think before I go into some of the um, issues that we would like to cover, I think it's probably useful to provide a bit of context in terms of data around what's been happening on trade. And that'll give you a bit of an idea of the, why we're raising the problems we're raising. So uh, FDF publishes um, quarterly data on trade between uh, the EU and the UK since 1st of Jan. We've just recently published our half one stat, so that covers from Jan to June. Uh, for trade with Ireland, that showed about a drop of about 500 million uh, in exports to Ireland compared to Jan 19 and about 400 when you compare it to Jan 2020. For imports, it's pretty much exactly the same. You've got about a half billion quid drops when you compare it to Jan 19 uh, and then uh, 400 when you compare it to the same period back in 2020 and for the EU as a whole it's about a 2 million quid drop, 2 billion quid sorry drop um, and the patterns within that pretty much are the biggest droppers are in the SPS category and that's why we want to raise those uh, kind of as the big problem so you typically see the big drops in cheese, beef, any sorts of dairy products and that one and that kind of takes us into the main problems we want to uh, raise with you today, which are the kind of the process between getting the EHC signed between the trader and the OV and then the pre notification time requirements um, in that. So on the first problem, um, I think, you know, one problem we've seen since 1st of January really is around the complexity of getting the, the EHC signed and that process between the OV and the trader. So you know, getting the the vet uh, on a particular GB to the EU side to be able to sign that, getting the trader to kind of give the vet the amount of data, the assurances that they need to uh, meet all of the regulations that are set out in the EHC is really quite a complicated process. It takes a lot of time and that is probably the biggest reason why we saw a lot of consignments that were grounded at UK factories and they couldn't move uh, into the EU is really that process of that engagement between the haulier um, sorry, the trader and the vet 
Um, and, then, and I guess that stems from a particular worry is that, you know, from 1st of October and 1st of January, you see kind of a shift away from food and drink traders. You know, it's for anyone who is the carriers of the goods, it's probably far easier for them to move furniture rather than it's food and drink for the nature of the complexity of SPS on that one. And then as well, tapping into this, I think is that, you know, there are some pretty notable shortages across the EU and the UK, particularly uh, for OVs. And I think that's a worry. So we've had one member who's raised with us that they think they're sharing uh, with about 20 companies of a single vet. And I guess that kind of taps into the worry around the kind of, you know, the timeliness of being able to do that. I think the second concern for us really is around the kind of pre-notification period. So um, SPS being the main area again, but there is a, a customs element that comes into it when we get to the 1st of January. Um, uh, but going back to the SPS, I think the pre-notification times are really what render or can render supply chains really, uh, or just kind of really slow them down. So we've got a, a four hour notification for October, which is very welcome. I think that'll be still be tricky for a lot of traders, but I think the real worry is when we get to 1st of January, you've got that 24 hour notification period that ports are expecting that really does bog supply chains down. And I think, you know, it just kind of adds a layer of time to the, the supply chains we're used to, and it kind of probably makes it kind of harder to serve, you know, a fast moving supply chain that we've come used to expect uh, harder. So those are the main problems I wanted to highlight on this call. I think I'm passing over to our good friend, uh, Paul Kelly at IBEC now. Uh, thanks very much, Luke. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Paul Kelly, Director of Food Drink Ireland in IVEC, representing food and drink companies in Ireland. And as Luke indicated, we've many common members with the FDF. Uh, and I think it's important to note uh, in terms of the two countries, we are each other's largest export market. And, and that's not a situation that is that is likely to, to change. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity to contribute here this morning. Um, very much echoing Luke's comments, it's important to note at the outset that we are discussing 24-7 supply chains. So you're talking about short turnaround times and just-in-time deliveries. So the resources of the authorities on both sides of the Irish Sea really must be sufficient to support the current business model in areas like the timely provision of health certificates, short and pre-notification periods, clear routing through border controls and consistency in border checks. And of course, we would like to see the EU and the UK agree on a move to digital certs as soon as possible. And that's a point I'm going to come back to. So clarity is key for business planning. And there are still outstanding queries that we have for both the 1st of October and the 1st of January. I think a number of these are, are starting to pop up in the, the chat along with, with other uh, questions and queries that will be addressed in the Q&A. But just a couple of ones specifically for myself. Four first for the 1st of October. Uh, question number one, will chilled meat and meat chilled mints and meat preparations be prohibited from the 1st of October? Secondly, is it mandatory to have the truck number on the certificates to GB or will trailer number or seal number be sufficient? Then in relation to the land bridge transit of products of animal origin from the 1st of October, the question remains, can any EU based export complete the IPAS notification? There is simply no GB importer in this scenario. And the final one from us from the 1st of October, some EU product of animal origin exporters have agreements with G GB customers for delivery duty paid. And in this case, the GB customer requires the EU exporter to look after all the customs and SPS paperwork. Therefore, can the EU based exporter register the pre notification on IPAS? Moving out a couple of months to the 1st of, of January, um, obviously we're looking at the, the introduction of the BCPs, the border control posts. So our question is, where will the Irish Sea BCPs be located? Both any temporary BCPs and the permanent BCPs when they are built. And for both scenarios, how will selected consignments be directed there? Second one is uh, the issue of uh, pre pre notification. I certainly would agree with everything Luke has said about that. It's a real concern, I think, from, from the members in terms of just in time supply chains. We obviously have the derogation essentially applied for the three months uh, for of October, November, December down to, to uh, four hours. And then when we move to the 1st of, of January, the intention is uh, 24 hours pre-notification with the derogation to, to four hours. And that derogation then to be decided upon uh, on a, essentially a consignment by consignment level by the individual port health authorities. So our question is, will guidance on how that derogation be applied be issued to port health authorities and when, essentially to ensure consistency in the approach at, at each BCP? 
And our final one, again, just to come back to the issue of the digital certs, when can we expect an agreement between both parties on the use of electronic rather than physical certs? And what are the outstanding issues to be addressed? So that's it for myself. I'll pass over to logistics colleagues at this stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I'm next. Uh, my name is Sam Lavadi from Logistics UK. Thanks for the opportunity to contribute today. Uh, I must say that I could support uh, almost all the points that have, made, have been made previously. Many of them were uh, on my list as well. But to start with, uh, I'd like to, uh, just by way of introduction, highlight how adaptable uh, the supply chains have been when the trading conditions changed at the end of the transition period. And I'm not only saying this to uh, to really um, uh, highlight the good work uh, done by, by this industry, but also uh, because this shows that uh, the policy changes, the policy decisions that are made, even the technical ones, have very concrete effects on uh, trade patterns and traffic patterns. And this is something to bear in mind. Uh, and I will refer to that when I raise some of the, um, the specific points after that. But we've seen, for instance, that uh, the popularity of the land bridge has uh, reduced at the beginning of the year. And even if it's not necessarily a definitive change, uh, really uh, policy decisions uh, have to take into account um, how sensitive uh, supply chains are. So in terms of the questions we still have, the things that are not fully clarified or not completely reassuring, uh, I would like to insist on uh, the facilities for inbound checks, uh, for instance, at Welsh ports for the land bridge. Uh, that's probably more for uh, the beginning of January next year. But there are still concerns in the logistics community around the readiness of facilities. So if there's a status update uh, regarding the exact organisation of the checks on, on the UK side and what this organisation means in terms of dimensioning and staffing the facilities that would be uh, useful to get a better sense of uh, where we are going. And in relation to that, um, information about the charging policy for the, the physical checks that will be conducted in those facilities will also be welcome, bearing in mind that there could be level playing field implications uh, if uh, the charging policies are different across different locations. Uh, again, in relation to uh, uh, the, the adaptability of um, the supply chains and what it could mean, what it could mean in terms of uh, trade routes. Uh, my next point is about official vet capacity, uh, and this is twofold. This is uh, on the certifying side, uh, and in this case, it would be in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, I welcome the information that has been provided about uh, the redeployment of staff, the recruitment that has been conducted. Um, so uh, in addition to that, there's also a question about the exact location of those certifying officers. Um, it's not only about having a sufficient number of them, it's also about making sure that they can reach the right locations, depending on the groupage models, for instance, that, that have been uh, used. Um, so that's also something um, I'm not completely clear about for uh, the upcoming deadlines. And the second aspect, about uh, official vet capacity is about um, capacity on the UK side because uh, as um, more physical checks are taking place uh, in border control posts, uh, a number of the, the, uh, the vets uh, that are currently in the UK will be uh, required to complete those tasks. So an update about uh, how this affects overall capacity would be welcome. And the last point, uh, trying to insist on uh, the driver end of things. Uh, and I think uh, our colleague from IBEC mentioned that uh, should the vehicle be selected for physical checks, uh, what is the exact process and what contingencies are in place uh, to uh, notify the driver that his vehicle or her vehicle has been selected for um, uh, physical checks? And a follow-up question, what is the process for unaccompanied freight uh, when uh, consignments are uh, identified and selected for physical checks? And in the interest of time, I will stop here. Thanks very much. Uh, good morning, uh, Aidan Flynn from the Freight Transport Association of Ireland. 
Um, I suppose the key issues from our members that are involved in import and export of products of animal origin, fish and plants from Great Britain's perspective resonates with what has already been highlighted. Um, whilst key dates for implementation of control measures have been predetermined, the ongoing uncertainty created through the complex nature of the distribution regulatory requirements and by the lack of information available is creating significant problems for businesses. The additional costs associated with the new rolling requirements are crippling and those involved in groupage, particularly the movement of multiple loads for multiple clients is becoming uh, untenable. The irony of this is that logistics is all about efficiencies and speed and certainty of delivery. With the environment at the top of the global agenda, the implications of post Brexit trade requirements are ensuring that vital trade distribution functionality is taking a beating and becoming less efficient, more costly and leading to the requirement for more rolling stock on our roads that results in more emissions. These issues do not seem to resonate at a political level, evidenced by the lack of urgency to establish key committees detailed in the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. It is through these committees that trade simplifications for the movement of agri-food and the defining of trusted trader programmes needs to urgently deliver solutions for all traders. And in the meantime, the sustainability of business, particularly small to medium sized businesses, continues to be challenged. We'd like to raise the following points for consideration uh, by the British authorities. Um, and I know some of this has already been covered in the slides today. Who is responsible for adding the information onto IPAFs? And whilst GB guidance advises that from October 1st, all documentary checks will take place electronically and remotely, more information and clarification is needed on the levels of physical and documentary checks and whether or not that they will take place in the ports or the environs of the ports and what levels of checks are to be expected from October. Also, if checks are to take place electronically, why then must the original health certificate accompany the load? What evidence will the driver accompanied haulier have to have upon arrival in British ports? And will the GVMS GMO registration require details of the IPAF's registration? Given that the importer is responsible for pre-notification, how will the haulier know that the pre-notification has been made? What are the consequences for the haulier if the pre-notification has not been made? Regarding unaccompanied trailers, are original health certificates required and what will the British-based haulier who have to present, will have to present when collecting trailers and bringing the load to its import destination? Regarding the land bridge, Will products of animal origin have to be pre-notified on IPAFs and who is responsible for doing this? Again, if documentary checks are to be electronic, can you provide more information for companies using the land bridge as to this process and will original health certificates be required? And for companies importing products of animal origin, say from the Netherlands via the land bridge into Ireland, will health certificates be required and can more information be provided in terms of new paperwork requirements from October? Uh, some issues for consideration for our, our Irish officials. Uh, noting the various models of groupage uh, with Daphne's preference for the consolidation model. Can Daphne provide an update on your engagement with industry and your understanding of the resources required to meet the demand of industry? Have you an activate reach program to industry to ensure that where the consolidation model or linear model is applied, that there will be the necessary vet resources to ensure a functioning supply chain? And can you furnish details, particularly for companies that because of volumes or economies of scale will not have full time on site vets on the process for booking services and how reliable that service will be. Who will be responsible for maintaining the service levels? Are you working currently with industry to adopt working time to meet industry demand? As you know, logistics 24 seven environment and moving fresh food and requires certification out of normal working hours. Will the department be resourced to facilitate this? And finally, Will there be checks at Irish ports, aside from normal PBN requirements, that pre-notification has been completed on IPAFs and original health certificates are accompanying the load? Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Aidan, and thanks to all the uh, speakers today. Lots uh, to reflect on, and I think uh, judging from the Q&A in the chat, um, it feels like that resonates well with the wider audience as well. So thank you for that summary. Um, Damien, I don't know, there was a few for Daffam there. I think most of them were for, were for our side in the UK. Do you want to start with the with the few that were mentioned for Daffam in, in those presentations and then we can go over to DEFRA colleagues? 
Yeah, thanks, Luke. And I want to thank the contributors uh, for making the time today and 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 sharing their their concerns with us. Um, yeah. So look, at I've I've tried to capture the ones that for that, and we, maybe we can come back to the ones if I miss anything. But I, I I briefly I'll just reflect on some of them, and then I'll call in my colleagues who have much more detail and they can respond. And um, so as I see it, uh, big, one of the big questions is about the, the certification and the capacity to actually deliver the certification. Um, I covered some of the preparation that we're doing in in my presentation. So I mean, there has been lots of engagement directly uh, locally uh, with, with, with food businesses uh, and those discussions are ongoing about refining business processes and, and aligning uh, systems to be able to support certification as required by business. But it's clear that business will have to adapt as well. You know, we only have a limited resource uh, that has to. And so those conversations are ongoing and are being con are, are constructive. But I, I, I'll pass it on to my colleagues when, uh, as well. The other one was around uh, e-certification. Again, uh, there are discussions ongoing between the EU and the UK on that uh, about, be, about putting in place an e-certification uh, approach. Um, it's not going to happen by the 1st of October, obviously, um, but there are early early 2022 is the current time that, that we have for that. Um, and then the other key key one that was raised by colleagues uh, was around the 24 hours and it's linked to the vet capacity about 24 seven operations and out of hours. Again, we're doing a lot of work on that uh, locally with with, with, with with food business to, 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 to ascertain what the challenge is there and to try and come up with solutions. Um, again, my colleagues will, will go into more detail on that. And we've also had an out of our survey as well, which is informing management decisions about redeployment of staff and re, re, reorganization of staff. So that's an ongoing, uh, that's a work in progress and we're working through that at the moment. And the other big one then for us was the group bridge and how group which would be serviced. Um, we're focused on consolidation hub approach or a linear, a linear uh, model approach where pallets may be sealed and then picked up in multiple locations. Um, again, my colleagues will touch on that uh, about how we're going to go about that and how we're going to resource that. So uh, with that, maybe just as an overview, I, I'll pass you on to my colleague uh, Lorna Meany, who maybe can address those uh, questions in more detail and she might call in uh, other colleagues, including uh, Tony Devlin and other colleagues uh, uh, as appropriate. So Lorna, maybe I can, can I hand over to you to give a, uh, your, your perspective on those questions? Lorna, sorry, I think you're on mute. It's Hello, can you hear me? Yes. OK, um, so just just to go through the list of questions uh, there again, the use of uh, electronic certificates um, is being explored. My understanding is it's been explored and negotiated between um, the EU and GB and maybe um, GB colleagues might have further information and, and could update us further on that. But my understanding is that it's at a fairly advanced stage, um, but it certainly won't be in place before the 1st of January. So um, so so those uh, negotiations are, are ongoing um, and obviously they would be of major benefit in smoothing out the um, certification process uh, for everybody involved. So so we are, you know, we're, we're very anxious that that, that would happen. Um, and I suppose as regards the, the cover, um, we're not we're not in a position to provide 24 uh, seven cover. Um, but what we have been doing is we've been engaging uh, locally with businesses who have flagged an out of hours requirement. So I suppose businesses should be engaging with um, their local department staff at the moment to find uh, solutions that meet the uh, certification demand in, in line with certification requirements and the OCR um, without putting undue demands on um, what Damien has already alluded to, our limited resources. Um, so these are being dealt with on a case by case basis um, uh, and uh, th they will require engagement with with us, and you know it will require um, flexibility on on the behalf of the businesses as well to work with us to find um, 
solutions. So as, as Damien said in his uh, presentation, it's really, really important that, um, uh, you know, people engage uh, locally, really important. Um, with, with the people who um, certify on the ground, they, sh they should uh, know who does their regular approvals and inspections. So if the key best, one of the key messages here, if you haven't already engaged uh, with your um, local department officials, um, you should definitely start doing that now. Um, in terms of, um, I, I suppose it's, it's just important to say as well that it isn't business as usual. There's now an extra step in the journey to the UK with the health certificate requirement. And, um, you know, we, we do have a limited veterinary resource, but just, just to move on to the other questions around what we've been doing as regards um, securing extra resources, um, we've already uh, recruited, we, the recruitment process has taken place. And so there are already extra resources either in place or will be in place very, very soon. Um, we have been, um, uh, you know, we have plans if necessary to redeploy staff in from other areas if 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 that is required. Um, and um, we also have um, uh, some some staff taken on on temporary contracts. So all of those things together, plus working with industry to um, to find solutions, um, you know, will will help in our preparedness for the 1st of October as regards our uh, resource need. Um, and I suppose it's important to say also that, um, you know, in our preparations, we have um, been involved in uh, training our own staff in the new certification requirements um, in our um, and, and also training our FBOs. We've had multiple seminars all through the summer, um, you know, dealing with um, the IT systems that we're using, the TRACES system in particular, um, and um, also the certification requirements. Um, we've had um, certification days this week where we've encouraged um, our food businesses to engage with us to do uh, mini trial runs um, right across the board to ensure that the processes that we have in place are working. And we have plans for a certification week uh, the week after next, um, where we'll be doing more of that. So all of this should help to make sure that we have um, sufficient processes in place uh, for the 1st of October. Um, I don't know if my colleague Tony Devlin wants to come in on um, any of those points. Um, Hello, uh, thanks Lorna. Yeah, just to pick up on a couple of points. So in relation to um, out of hours trade and uh, those aspects, we have undertaken very comprehensive surveys of what the demand is. And we're now in a position where the local veterinary inspectors are engaging with the uh, with the businesses to see if some of that trade can be can be um, can be moved into more I suppose more manageable blocks within certification windows. Um, and where that's not possible, then we're looking for the what we call the pinch points where there is a demand, and we may not have a service that so we can look look at that and see what we can do um, in the next in the coming weeks to to be able to provide as much of a service as possible. Um, as has been said, like it's not business as usual, so there has to be some movement on on the business side to um, to to um, to provide to to allow for you know the, the limited veterinary resource. And you know we have gone into extensive recruitment, we have redeployment, and we have temporary contracts of um, experienced staff. So we're trying to identify where the greatest demands are and allocate resources to those points. But it's key, um, a key part of that. Is that the businesses themselves engage locally and talk through their demands, talk through their systems and what can be done. Um, some of the delays may be initially due to uh, non-familiarisation with traces and we have done extensive uh, training on traces on the traces systems and even in spite of that we know that some businesses maybe not haven't fully engaged with that so for that reason we're doing some more training uh, at the end of the month so that'll be a chance for those maybe that haven't fully engaged um, to, to get involved because some of the problems that are arising and the delays that are arising in the trials that we've done to date are that, you know, maybe the wrong cert, cert has been submitted, the wrong uh, commodity codes, 
there's been a uh, lack of practice just in using the trace systems and having the correct traceability um, documentation that is needed. So the more accurate information that's submitted with the type one application or the part one of the traces application, then the easier it is for the certifying veterinary surgeon to, to sign off and get the documentation back to, to the business, which we understand is, is you know, time sensitive. Uh, on the DPCS system, then that's also going to be tried throughout, throughout, it's been tried throughout this week and there will be further trials ongoing. So it's really practicing the generation of the health certificates and the logistics and getting them uh, back to the to the drivers. And we're working on that and we're working through that um, a, a week from, from now until I suppose the 1st of October. So we should have a good idea of where the pinch points are, where the demand is, and maybe where we can make adjustments to what our, our um, preparations are to, to meet the demands. So that, that's just where we are at the moment. Thanks, Lorna. So thanks, Tony and Lorna. Look, I mean, you can hear there, look, look, there's so much going on and has been going on and it's still going on and will be right up until the 1st of October. Just to reiterate, from the department's point of view, we're fully committed to delivering the service that's needed and working with industry to deliver that service. But we do need industry to, to, to work with us and those conversations are ongoing. So as, as the guy said, the really key message is engage with us, particularly at local level, to make sure that your business and, and, and our service can, can be matched as much as possible. And uh, we're committed to delivering what's required to make sure that, we're, that there's any disruption to trade with, with GB is minimised from the 1st of October. So look, maybe I'll hand back to you and, and then, because I know there's quite a few questions for DEFRA colleagues, and maybe we can let this session run, because I think a lot of the questions are, are very similar to uh, what, what's coming in on the chat. So maybe we can run through the questions that were posed uh, to DEFRA colleagues. That would be a good way of leading into our Q&A session, more, our more broader Q&A session. Thanks. Thank you, Damien. Yes, I think I agree. There's lots of lots of good questions here. Just to know um, on the engagement side, totally echo that as well. Um, we appreciate there's still a lot of uncertainty and questions from businesses. We are on the UK side also running many events, some of them in, in collaboration with other administrations like today, many um, UK administration only. I know DEFRA have their own events, which Helena has plugged some of earlier in the presentation and which the uh, information is available online and BPDG are also running events again, some of them in collaboration with DEFRA uh, as well, which Margaret will be able to talk about a little bit at the end and provide information and links to. Um, so just quickly on to the DEFRA questions then, Helena. I know Damien spoke about the e-certification. I don't know if there's anything you want to add there, but it seems like the first question to address is on the UK side, the EHC requirement and what happens if the EHC isn't there? Thank you very much. Um, I think the thing that what, what I would like to do is actually rather than me talking in generalities, um, I will um, I will pass you straight on to my experts. Um, who can talk about a lot of the things that you were that that colleagues um, from the industry were were reflecting upon? Um, I would just like to say before I, I pass on to my experts that uh, I I am familiar with a lot of the messages that were coming through from the industry, particularly about just in time supply chains, um, the challenges of groupage, um, and and making sure that the systems work as, as smoothly as as possible, um, given how how you know we are talking about our food supply after all. Um, so with that in mind, I think I would just really like to hand over to my colleague Jack Tilbury, who's going to talk about. Um, a whole load of, of the questions that you were posing. Thank you, Jack. Thanks, Helena, um, and hopefully everyone can hear me OK. Um, so I've, I've pulled a few, few uh, bits out that I'll speak to um, from, from what we just heard uh, from industry, but I'll start with the question, Luke, that you just raised. Uh, so what happens if there is no EHC with the consignment from the 1st of October? Now, I think the thing to stress is uh, that it is a legal requirement to pre-notify and have the EHC, um, but there are no customs holds in place from the 1st of October. Um, those are only introduced from the 1st of January. From the 1st of October, um, we'll be carrying out the remote documentary checks, and this is very much a period where the Port Health authorities will check those notifications, check those uh, health certificates, and will be able to um, give feedback based on that. And we very much see this as a really important build up to the 1st of January. Um, that feedback 
you know, can prove critical uh, to help you avoid in delays when those checks do come in from the 1st of January um, where, and when those customs holds are in place. Because it, as soon as you uh, reach the 1st of January, if you haven't notified and you haven't got the required documentation, um, you know, you're very likely to be called into the BCP and you will be held uh, and the consignment potentially will be will be rejected um, or returned. Um, then, so uh, as I said, I pulled out just a, a couple of other key themes I'll talk to and then uh, perhaps see if any of my other colleagues want to come in. Um, and I think the first one is the pre-notification times. Uh, I know it was noted that um, we recently uh, issued some guidance um, allowing industry to apply the four hour derogation themselves. Um, and there's some questions around what, what the approach will be from January. I think it's important to note that the, the legislation specifies uh, one working day in advance and that the competence authority at the border control post can apply that uh, derogation. Um, and I think there was a question around whether DEFRA would set a central um, application um, and we won't. It is going to be down to the Port Health authorities. Uh, the 1st of October onwards is going to be a good opportunity for the Port Health authorities to get a better understanding of the time taken for the documentary checks and they'll be able to use that uh, understanding and you know it, the experiences they're having from the 1st of October to determine how and when they may choose to apply those derogations. I think the critical thing to remember as well is that each BCP does operate differently. Um, they will it will be dependent on the routes taken to arrive at that port um, and also the, the local circumstances. Um, in terms of what we'll do as part of that process, you know, we will obviously continue to work with the Port Health authorities to understand how and when they're going to choose uh, to make that derogation available from the 1st of January. And if there is, uh, you know, something we can do to make sure that information is readily available and easy to access, um, then I'm sure there's a role for us there and we'll pick that up. Um, so the next thing uh, slightly related, I suppose, I wanted to talk through was IPAFs uh, and who can submit the notification. And I saw there were quite a few questions in the actual Q&A as well relating to this. Um, so for imports into Britain from the EU, it must be uh, some the person responsible for the consignment must have a UK address and it's them that will need to raise the notification and be detailed uh, on the application. Um, I did see a few questions uh, around what uh, what will happen where you ship direct to consumer um, and the, the the guidance is the same. It must it must be someone with a UK based address. Uh, so in those circumstances, if you don't have a UK entity that can raise that notification for you and be detailed, you may need to look to employ um, a UK based agent who can who, who can be that entity and raise that notification. Um, I will run through a couple more. I won't talk for too much longer. Uh, the charging policy came up as well, um, and I just wanted to reconfirm that from the 1st of October, Port Health authorities won't be levying any fees and charges. Uh, so no fees and charges for SBS checks from the 1st of October, um, but that from the 1st of January, they will be able to levy fees and charges. Um, and again, those will be set by the Port Health Authority, similar to the application of the, the notification derogation. Um, but again, if there is you know, something that DEFRA can do to, to make that information uh, more easily accessible and centrally available, then I'm, I'm sure we will look to do that. Um, and finally, I just wanted to talk very briefly about groupage, not in any depth, but I did see there were a few questions in the Q&A uh, asking around uh, about seals and uh, official seals versus commercial seals. Uh, and I have gone through and answered a couple of them referring to the linear model, um, but I just wanted to plug uh, that we do have some uh, recordings that talk through each of the models in much more depth than we've been able to do so today. Um, and we do have some additional guidance, uh, some one pages that set out the models uh, and Q&As that will talk through, uh, you know, what we what we mean by official seals and commercial seals um, and how those are applied. So uh, there's clearly a keen interest there and I would, um, you know, Helen, I'm sure we'll be able to send the link around to those materials and people can access that. And I think that would be um, that would be helpful to get that that better understanding than we were able to give you this morning. I will stop there. I don't know if any of my colleagues want to come in and pick up anything I've missed. Thank you. I will pause for effect briefly um, just to check if anybody wanted to come in before we get stuck into the uh, more detailed Q&A. 
but I don't th think so. No, in which case I think I'm handing back to Luke and Margaret uh, for the start of the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much all. Um, that was a, a really interesting discussion and I hope we can pick up the detail from some of the questions in the chat. Um, but Helena, the first one I think has got to go to you. I think we talked through the themes earlier, but the strong theme at the moment is that uh, following the rollover of the grace period in Northern Ireland, are there any plans to um, delay the GB import requirements? Thank you. I think if I may, I'll just take that that question in a slightly more to a, to a slightly higher level, um, which is, is the UK government going to delay import um, controls of, of goods from EU to GB? Um, so um, as of this moment, businesses do need to continue to prepare for the introduction of import controls based on the requirements that, that we are setting today. However, of course, if they were to change, uh, we will work extremely closely, not only with businesses, but also with our colleagues in Ireland to ensure that all businesses and all related authorities are aware. Um, I think I will stop there, please, Margaret, and move on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, I've just been going through the questions and forgive me all of you if I haven't quite picked up all of the detail, but as you've heard from the discussions, um, there are a number of themes and one of the big ones are those around health certifications um, and whether they're required for confectionery, for biscuits and for will there be additional requirements for button mushrooms? I wonder if our colleagues in the in DEFRA could help us with that, please. Uh, thank you very much. I think um, the person that I'm going to I'm going to start off with because she hasn't spoken yet um, is my colleague uh, on button mushrooms etc might be able to help our plant health imports delivery lead even though I know that button mushrooms are not plants they are in fact fungi um, but Vicky are you able to help with that question? Hello. Um, so, so this is a question about whether uh, a, a mushrooms need um, sanitary certificates from the 1st of October. Um, in short, the answer is no. Um, plant health requirements uh, do not come in until uh, January 2022 in any case. Um, so we're slightly different from uh, products of animal origin, um, etc. Um, but um, I think the question has been answered in the chat. Um, mushrooms are not um, considered a, a plant or so are not regulated from a plant health perspective so therefore will, will not require a phytosanitary certificate however um, it's I'm not an expert in this area but I would suggest that the person who posed the question would want to check whether there are any requirements from a, a marketing standards perspective for mushrooms um, as well so in terms of certificates of conformity but unfortunately I'm not an expert in that area so I can't answer that but I would advise them to check them requirements. And of course, if they are organic, um, that's a whole. And organic, yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, I am then going to bring in. Um, I, I'm sorry, Jack. Um, you are a bit of our expert on all things uh, products of animal origin and potentially composites. Um, so, Jack, could you come in on on some of those composite questions, please? Obviously, I did cover a bit of this in the presentation. So I think the question, um, correct me if, I was, if I'm wrong, was whether confectionery and biscuits would be composite products. Was that right? Mm -hmm. um, so it will be dependent on on the ingredients that make up the product. Um, so if, if it's if it has uh, animal products in it, uh, then it may be. But there are exemptions that will apply to composite products, um, which I will not go through in detail now because they are they are quite long. Um, but there is guidance available, and we can link you to the gov.uk page that sets out what that um, what those exemption requirements are. Um, I actually just want to pause and see if uh, Suzanne wants to add anything because I think she um, is probably better placed to answer the composite specific questions than I am. Um, hi. Hello Suzanne. Hi yeah it's Suzanne. Um, I have actually um, put some answers in the chat on confectionery and biscuits. Um, if they fall within the scope of Annex 2 of retained decision 2007-275 um, then they will not be subject to controls at the border, will not need a health certificate. Um, and as Jack said, they might, um, if they're cover, covered by composite products, 
and meet the requirements of Article 6, again, they would be exempt from, from the conditions. Um, I haven't actually put the link to the gov.uk guidance um, in the chat, but as Jack said, we'll, we can provide that later. Thank you. Oh, sorry, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I just linked to the health certificates question. There was a question about whether small parcels, so business sending goods, for instance, an example given with smoked salmon to consumers uh, in the UK, would they still need certificates? If I'm right, I, I think it doesn't matter about the size of the, and the recipient, they will still need certificates if the goods require a certificate. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. Um, they will still be subject to SPS controls. Lovely. And either uh, is there a nice sorry, step? Sorry, sorry, can I just um, cut in there? If if they're personal imports, then they would be exempt. So, so if, a, it, if, it, if it's personal imports, I think it's less than 20 kilos or the size of a small fish when we're talking about fishery products. So, so is that when it, you bring it, something back lit, with you? Exactly. That would yeah. be a, somebody going to Ireland on holiday um, finding some lovely Irish smoked salmon or or whatever and wanting to take it back with them. That would be a personal import. Um, anything that is a business, as in you are take you are sending a package back uh, to uh, you know you are you are sending a package for a business reason. That would definitely require uh, a health certificate. Thank you. And there's a step by step guide. Is there for businesses who need to start on this road now? Is there a handy link that they can look through I'm sure if somebody could post the link in the chat that'd be great thank you um, so um, thank you very much um, there's a lot of questions about certificates not being available when the goods are being loaded onto a truck is it possible to send a copy of the certificate because of course as we know they should travel with the goods is it possible to ship that via courier to a pre-agree point such as the BCP in the UK Jack, can you um, answer that one? I will. I don't know if Anthony wants to come in after me, but um, it's it is a requirement that the original EHC uh, needs to be available and provided to the officials um, if they request it. Um, it is essentially for the exporter or the logistics handler to make sure that those documents are available and presented at the BCP if requested. Um, that may mean enclosing the documents inside a container that they travel with the driver um, or hand them you know, some other way of handing them over in person. But I think the key point is that they have to be available if they are requested. Um, but again, I don't know if uh, Anthony wants to come in and add anything to that. No, nope, thanks, Jack. That covers it nicely from my perspective. Thank you. And there was a uh, there was a question in the chat, which uh, and apologies if you've already picked it up for DAFM colleagues, about whether checks would be uh, done in Ireland to ensure that a certificate is travelling when the goods leave Ireland for GB. I wonder if Damien and team could pick that one up. Okay. Your mute seems to have um, speeded up now, Damien. Oh, is it? So can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, yeah. Thanks, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> this is what I didn't course there when I thought it wasn't on me. <laughs> um, so yeah, look, at, I'll let my colleagues, uh, but we won't be doing any checking on certs at ports or as they leave the country or anything. I think there was a question about that. Uh, and I think one of our uh, trader reps actually raised that question as well uh, in advance with us. So that's my understanding, uh, but maybe uh, Lorna can confirm that for me. We have a temperamental teams session this morning. Sorry, Lorna, how's, how's the unmute going? <laughs> or if one of our other colleagues could jump in maybe and yeah. unmute if, Rob. Can, yeah. you hear, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Martin, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I can, yeah, I can answer that. Like there'll be no, uh, once the consignment leaves the certification point, we'll have you know, no further checks on uh, ports of exit like the load will then travel unhindered. Perfect. Thank you. OK, we should have the certs. Right. 
Um, I'm going to come on to IPAFs. Jack, I know you covered a lot about IPAFs, but and forgive me if I'm going over all ground, but um, just to be very clear, can an Irish exporter use IPAFs? Do they need to be established in the UK to register on IPAFs? And if so, they'd have to get an agent then if they weren't established in the UK. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Um, okay. Yeah, we, they do. They are required to have a UK uh, based entity. We do have, um, I think Angela Cooper here is the IPAFs project manager if she wants to bring in, um, bring in any other points of detail about IPAFs and IPAFs use. Angela? Hello, can you hear me all right? You can. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, so yeah, Jack's correct. You do need um, to be UK based. Um, so um, yeah, there's not much else to add really. OK, um, while we sorry, have Margaret. You could, could sorry, I come in on that one? Just I think there was a question. There was a question uh, just while we're on iPads. There was a question from uh, I think it might have been Paul or, or Aidan about transits. And obviously there's no GB entity normally involved in a, in a transit transaction. So I don't think we covered that one in the trader session. So maybe could you could you cover that one about who does the iPads for? No, I, th I think that, that's um, a good idea. I was actually going to ask Scott Rainey to come in and talk a bit about transits if there was an opportune moment. Um, Scott, are you able to come in and talk about transits? Yes. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, so yes, just picking up that question uh, around uh, pre-notification and having a UK entity for transits. Now, obviously for transits, we wouldn't have a, a UK entity, so then we We'll come back to you separately to this in terms of whether there is any scope to allow a non UK entity to, to fill in IPAF's pre notification for transit goods going across GB. Um, but yeah, I may just need to come back to that point after this if I can and confirm. Um, Scott, I can do that for you. Okay, now thank that's you. That's helpful. We, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I had a conversation with Vlad about this a uh, couple of days ago. You will still need um, a UK entity. It's because um, it needs to be traceable. Um, and so, yes, in that situation, you would need to employ a, a UK based agent to handle that part of the movement for you. Thank you both. Um, so while we're on the subject of transit, um, I thought uh, another couple of questions came in about what happens if um, the EU supplier does not have an EHC and does not pre-notify from the 1st of October if they're transiting through the land bridge? Um, so I will come in on this one as well. Uh, so I would think this is this, the principle is similar to, to what I talked about um, for imports earlier. Um, it is, of course, a requirement that you do um, and you know you will need to do so. Um, but ultimately, this per this period from the 1st of October to the end of December, um, you know, will give you vital feedback on whether the notification and the health certificates have been completed uh, correctly. And again, uh, in line with the direct imports, there won't be any customs holds as these goods arrive. But from the 1st of January, there will be. And if you've, you know, if the Port Health Authority determine that the, the notification is incorrect or the EHC is, uh, has errors or it hasn't been submitted, um, then those goods will be held and possibly rejected. Thank you. Um, unless anybody else wanted to come in uh, on a transit related subject, but this one from more for our customs colleagues. Um, this is about whether the GB authorities need to be notified as goods leave the UK. If they're transiting from Ireland through uh, GB, do they need to notify authorities when leaving GB? My understanding for transit is that you would not have to do that because when you arrive in the new customs territory, say France, for instance, your Office of Transit um, notification there will alert authorities here. Is that correct, Claire? Or Lindsay, are you? Hi, Margaret. I think we've got uh, James from our transit team on. Perfect. Today, so he, he may want to come in on this, but yeah, you're quite right. It really depends on where your office of destination uh, and transit and departure are listed on your routeway. That's okay, what so you need to declare. Yeah. Can I just come in on that point as well from a SPS by security perspective, there is a requirement for 
SPS goods transiting GB to be notified when they leave GB territory. And we'll, we're expecting an email notification coming through to a central point to confirm yeah. that they've actually left the country. I see. Well, thank you. Yeah. And, and okay. Margaret, I should Important have added, point. of course, uh, that our um, exit summary declarations, safety and security declarations, uh, will we have got a waiver in place at the moment for goods moving through Roro, including where they're under transit. That will come to an end in October. So the safety and security declarations will need to take place. But there is a default on that and we are working with carriers and hauliers because there is an automatic default that uh, there's a notification uh, through Chief CDS and NCTS. So more on that, I'm sure there'll be plenty more guidance on, on transit movements in coming days. Can I just um, add an IPAFS point to that as well? So um, when you're creating your notification on IPAFS, if you choose reason for movement as transit, you'll be asked to enter your exit date and part in the um, service as well. Thank you all very much. Um, I'm going to come back to IPAFs um, and a few more technical questions, um, just uh, for you if you're ready. Um, some, uh, one of our attendees talked about it, having done a test in IPAFs and they've submitted some documents and it shows that the status has submitted. Is that correct? Is there any more they need to do now? Um, no, I did respond in the chat to this one. Um, Thank you, Angela. Sorry, I haven't been picking up all the answers. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so as soon as it says submitted, that's everything that you need to do in IPAFs. That means the BCP have now got a copy of it and they will do their checks. Um, if there is any additional feedback on it, any, any of the documents, then they will get back in touch using your contact details that you supply via uh, Government Gateway. Thank you. Um, and uh, does a haulier need proof that the IPAFs is done, is it, does the haulier or the driver just need to have the, the health certificates? Um, I wouldn't say they, they must have evidence, but if they do want to have evidence for their own sort of confidence that it's been um, created, you can download the no notification in IPAFs. Um, so you just download, the, download it as a web page um, and that can be sent across if need be. Thank you. Um, I've got a, a, a question I'm just going to throw out to all of you now about SPS goods coming into GB for exports from GB, coming from Ireland to GB to be consolidated and then exported out of here. Um, must they remain under bond in the UK? Um, and if they are, do they have to be consolidated in a bonded warehouse? And if, if they're going to be unloaded in the UK, what is it? What is the requirements there? Is that a tricky one? <laughs> Um, I don't know if we have any colleagues who uh, cover exporting, so I won't I won't try and answer this on their I, behalf. I think um, uh, we have very intentionally brought colleagues who are who are um, imports experts with a transit focus, uh, occasional transit focus. So we don't necessarily have the right experts. But Anthony, you did come on video. I did. So maybe yes. you will be I able thought. to answer. However, I, could, I could try. Um, it Thank might not you. be the final answer, but but the but so if the goods have been brought into the UK market and into the GB market particularly, um, and are in free circulation, um, then the in order to move them to the EU, they need to follow the normal EU export rules and requirements, including certification. The bit I'm more hazy about is the use of bonded warehouses, where that, whereas I understand that to mean they haven't entered free circulation and, and under some sort of customs hold, in which case that's more of a, a, a transit question of, you know, EU transiting UK going back to EU. And that's where I get a bit hazy. <laughs> so I think it might be worth taking this away and consulting those that have been involved with the transits from the, the reverse side, looking at it from a EU transit, EU perspective rather than the other way around. But uh, so we might want to come back with more details, but that's the best I can provide right now. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so that was a tricky one. It might be better to come back with written detail and we'll liaise with our customs colleagues. Right. Um, the, one of uh, the attendees has mentioned a video that DAFM has produced about sealing a pallet and they wanted confirmation that that was acceptable to DEFRA. And there are a number of other questions about official seals and some clarification sought about when an official seal is needed. Um, I don't know if you've been picking those up as you go through the chat, but if somebody could come on and 
clarify the position on seals. Um, sorry, Margaret, I don't know if anybody else didn't catch it, but I heard you mention a video, but I didn't I didn't catch oh. the rest of the first part of what you said. Apologies, sorry. So um, uh, one of the attendees has mentioned a, a video that DAFM has produced, which sets out how to seal a pallet. And the uh, attendee asked if that particular approach is acceptable to DEFRA. There were then some follow up questions about um, uh, there's some confusion about whether an official seal is needed or not. Um, and if not, will um, the seal section on the EHC be left blank? So there were a number of questions about seals and I just thought it might be useful to clarify the position. Rather than go into the specifics, perhaps we could just um, talk about rather answer the specific question. Let's just talk about seals and um, just make sure that we're we're correct. Um, and just uh, so maybe Jack, can you can you cover off uh, seals with some colleagues? I think that would be that would be enormously helpful. Thank you. Yes. So so um, where we mention official seals, uh, essentially we mean that the seal has been placed in sight of the certifying officer and they've certified that seal was placed in front of them and it's been annotated and signed on the EHC. Um, in terms of what seals, we don't specify a type of seal that must be used. So uh, in this scenario, if our Irish colleagues are happy to certify that the product has been sealed, we will accept that the product has been sealed in front of the certifying officer. Um, the requirement for official seals is stipulated on certain health certificates, I believe, um, and it is uh, it's certainly not the case for all um, health certificates. They don't all mandate an official seal being placed. Um, that obviously has a slight uh, difference when we're talking about the linear groupage model, uh, where an official sealing is a, is a is a part of that in order to make that model work. Um, I'm going to pause uh, because I think Anthony may be able to offer more on sealing, um, which will be helpful. Yeah, thanks, Jack. Um, so supporting that so that if you're using the groupage models, then um, you, you're likely to see a requirement for, for sealing as part of that model. The principle when using, you know, the so a pallet level seal would be that, that it needs to maintain the integrity um, of the consignment um, and also link that consignment to the export health certificate. Um, and I think the video is being referred to, if I'm thinking of the right one, this is a video showing different options um, the industry has come up with in order to try and seal at a pallet level rather than at a, at a truck level. Uh, obviously, there, there could be a million different ways of achieving the, the same results and I think that I think DEFRA have produced their own guidance as well that I can remember seeing uh, you know using you know using nets or cages or that there are there are different means but the I, I don't think we can say in advance without having actually seen um, the, the pallet in front of us what will or won't be acceptable um, it would be a matter of uh, if you're looking to use a new type of pallet level seal um, that that inspection post hasn't seen before, um, then it would be worth you know, either doing a trial run or sending photographic evidence and agreeing in advance what that might look like uh, to try and reduce the chance of, of pallet level seals being rejected. But there isn't one standardised way of, of, of doing it. Uh, it just needs to meet the objectives of sealing. So I think that's that's where we're sat, although I see that we've got a hand up. Um, Hi, Margaret, if you'd mind if I could just come in for a second, because this is a query do, yeah. which has come from a number of our members and maybe I can add a little bit of additional detail. So it really relates to the uh, DEFRA's groupage webinar, which took place was I think last week or, or, or the week before, the one that was run sort of two days in a row. Um, and there's a slide there, slide 34, which describes a number of sealing options. It's a non-exhaustive list because it starts off by saying forms of pallet level seal could include and then it talks about strapping with uh, shrink wrap or the straps cross over both ways, wire wrap with uh, sh uh, shrink wrap, uh, sealed large reusable netting and, and so on. So it lists three or four options there, it, but it's obviously a non-exhaustive list. On the other hand, the some of the, the information we've received from the, the Department of Agriculture here in Ireland uh, uses a photograph where we see actually tape used in, instead. So a question which is coming from a number of our members is, is tape actually uh, a, a, a suitable alternative? And again, the rest of it happens under the normal process with the, the official veterinarian and, and so on. But it's just actually the actual uh, securing method uh, using tape and then using a, a tamper proof seal at, at, at the point where you get the crossover of the tape. Don't 
don't know if anyone else can comment. For, from my perspective, I, I couldn't confirm that's OK without actually seeing how the tape was being used. Um, and it, it, it's a matter of looking at it, looking at the palette and saying, is it possible for anyone to tamper with that palette, add or remove products without the seal being, you know, with the seal remaining intact, i.e. the seal needs to be broken in order for anything to change on the palette. Um, but uh, you know, without seeing it, I couldn't, couldn't say whether or not that was acceptable. But Damien, I don't know if you're about to come in. Yeah, th th thanks, Anthony. Yeah, sorry, my my system dropped, so I'm I'm on my colleague's uh, line at the moment. So, um, yeah, look at it. I think maybe I, I'll get one of my colleagues, Lorna, maybe to come in on sealing more generally, just to explain uh, what we're doing on sealing and where that's that, that that that's coming from. I mean, as I understand it, we're, we've kind of piggybacked on the work the UK did on you know their export sealing for pallet level seals, and you know we're trying to follow as much as possible you know what the work they've done since the first of January on that. But but Lorna, maybe can you come in on that and just give it a yeah, bit more I background? Can, I hope you can hear me there now, um, Damien. Yeah. yeah, we can, yeah. Yeah, I suppose just as regards seals, we're not being too prescriptive around um, the seals, except that they must be robust, numbered and tamper evident. So that's the first thing. Um, and that ties in what, with what Anthony said there, that like, I mean, if it's 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 a mechanism to secure the consignment so that there can be no substitution or it can't be interfered with um, post uh, certification. Um, so what we've been saying to people is um, that they must engage locally and uh, with with staff who will be doing the certification um, so that they can see they can demonstrate exactly the seal type that they intend to use and see if it's appropriate and fit for purpose. So, so that that's how people should proceed as regard regards pallet seals. They should, as we were saying before, engage locally, uh, give a demonstration of the type of seal that was intended to be used on the pallets, um, and agree with the certifying officer how they would be applied or if they're suitable. So, thank you. I didn't realise I'd started a, a lively conversation and I've just seen the time is running away with us. We've got only a couple of minutes left, so I'm just going to leave it there. Um, unless there's anything any of our um, officials, he Helena, Damien, you'd like to say just before we finish up any key points you'd want to bring out. Yeah, maybe maybe I'll start from the Irish side. Look, I want to thank uh, all all the contributors today, uh, both from DAFM, DEFRA, HMRC, uh, BDBG, all the Irish colleagues as well for giving their time and and industry and and businesses for logging on. I think there's a very there's a lot of questions still. We can see that. I think the chat obviously shows that, and even the interaction with the trader association. So I think this is not finished. We need to we need to follow up on this, and we need to we, we need to work through some of these issues. And um, there are some key issues around the land. Bridge in particular, which we're, we're we're concerned about, so I think we will be following up offline with you on some of those to get further clarity, um, and also issues around obviously some of the questions today spilled into one January and how the BCPs will work, and you know I think there's a whole other raft of questions there. We didn't address issues like how how's the progress at the BCPs, you know where where will they be, how how will that work? So I think there's a whole extra layer of questions that will be open uh, that we have to follow up on uh, on that. I mean, in terms of the 1st of October, uh, the key message from our side is to engage with us, engage locally and also engage with all the different resources that we have and the call centres that we have. Uh, we're, we, we need to engage and communicate. So uh, we're open to doing that and we want to do that and we will pass messages on to our UK colleagues as well. So again, I just want to say thank you to everybody for participating, Helena, her team, Margaret, you and your team and uh, my own colleagues for all the work they've done on this. And thank thank you to our contributors in session two as well. They put a, a strong effort in as well. So again, just to say to them as well, I think they had some specific questions. So we will come back on those as well. I think anything we missed today, I think we, we, we will definitely commit to coming back with written answers on those as well. So thank you. Maybe I'll just hand over to Helen. I don't know whether you want to say anything and before Margaret wraps up. I'm just going to um, echo completely Damien's thanks, um, uh, particularly to all of our IRS counterparts who um, we continue to work exceptionally closely with. And I'm very, very grateful for all of the kind of collaboration that we have, um, which you are seeing in this this truly joint event. Um, of course, to all my DEFRA colleagues for joining as well as BPDG colleagues, um, obviously key messages for 1st of October. Uh, ensure that you get your health certificate if you need one and that your importer pre-notifies for products found on origin. I will leave it there. Um, thank you so much, Margaret. 
Thank you all. Um, uh, yes, I, I think uh, this is the first time we've done an event like this, having the technical session in the middle of it. Um, I, th I think it's gone well. We've brought lots of information out and I suspect we could sit here all day talking about all of these things, but we will uh, share the recording. We will be sharing the slides um, and we will capture all of your questions and we will provide answers to them and publish those for you as well. But uh, it just remains for me to say thank you to everybody who's participated today and you, the audience, for joining us. Thank you.